All right, so here's an exercise where some of the details are similar to an exercise I proved previously. Um, and so let's go through this. Um, let's see here. So the first thing, I first claim, or rather, we should, to make these uh, functions a little easier to write, to find phi n of x, to be the sum from m equals 1 to infinity of m times 2 to the minus n times the indicator function of e n comma m. All right, so, so, here, so note that and we will use this fact later. If x is an e n comma m, then this means that phi n of x is m times two to the minus n. Because if x is in e n m, that means that f of x is in this range. And so phi n is going to be, right, yeah, this is just by this is clear this is clear from the definition of phi n. So we're gonna prove a few things about these phi n's. Um, we must first show that phi n of x is always going to be less than or equal to phi n plus one of x. And when I prove this, I, I proved this fact for very similar functions, if not the exact same functions, in a previous exercise, and I sort of glossed over this proof. I want to prove it in detail here. So suppose x is in E and M, then this means that M times two to the minus N is less than or equal to F of X, which is less than or equal to m plus 1 times 2 to the minus n. So we want to figure out where x can belong in terms of e n plus 1. So what we can do is in order to have e n plus 1 we need to have 2 to the minus n minus 1. And so we need an extra factor of 2 so if we want to divide by 2, we need to multiply by 2 as well. So 2m times 2 to the minus n minus 1. So less than or because that's negative the quantity n plus 1. So this is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to 2 times the quantity n plus 1 times 2 to the minus n minus 1. Okay, so then where could x be? x is going to be e n plus 1 comma well we see this lower bound corresponds to e n plus 1 comma 2 m right because um, if f of x is between 2 m because yeah we, we just look at this definition of e n comma m and we see that the lower bound 2 m times 2 to the minus n minus 1 corresponds to m equal to, t we replace the m in the definition with 2m and we, we replace the n with n plus 1. And we get this. Okay, but if f is between 2m, um, if f is between 2m times 2 to the n, so that only goes up to f that only accounts for f being less than or equal to two, the quantity 2m plus 1 times 2 to the minus n minus 1. If f is between quantity 2m plus 1 times 2 to the minus n minus 1 and 2m here. For, for the other one, we have e n plus 1 comma 2m plus 1. But then this isn't quite good enough either because if we look at this, this only accounts for 
the possibility that x is less strictly less than the quantity 2m plus 1 times 2 to the minus n minus 1. But if we look at this, the range that f of x here is allowed to take, it could be as large as 2 times the quantity 2m plus 1. So it could actually be, it could actually go up to, um, we could have a 2m plus 2 there instead. And so this is actually, we have e n plus 1, 2m plus 2. And of course, since f of x must be less than or equal to, oh wait, what if it's equal to? No, that can't happen. If e is an n comma m, then this must be a strict inequality. Right, okay, there we go. Okay, so now we're, now we're good. So x is going to be in one of these three things. And the short, the, the, what I'm about to write in short is just going to say that if you evaluate um, v n plus 1 of x, then it's going to be greater than or equal to v n of x. Because if you look at the corresponding e n plus 1 set where x belongs, it's going to evaluate to something which is, which can only be greater than or equal to v n of x, which is precisely m times 2 to the minus n. So doing this in detail, if x is in e n plus 1 comma 2 m, then v n plus 1 of x is, just by our definition, we take 2 m times 2 to the minus n minus 1, which is precisely m to minus n, which is precisely phi n of x. If instead x is in en plus 1 to m plus 1, then phi n plus 1 of x is now going to equal the quantity 2m plus 1 times 2 to the minus n minus 1, which is going to be strictly greater than 2m times 2 to the minus n minus 1, which we just proved is equal to phi n of x. And lastly, similar thing happens in this final case. It should be a smaller 2 because it's in a subscript. phi n plus 1 of x is going to equal 2, 2m plus 2 to the minus n minus 1, which is strictly greater than, again, Vn of x. Thus, Vn of x is always going to be less than or equal to V n plus 1 of x. And this, of course, is true for n equals 1. It, uh, you, can, you can see that Phi n phi1 of x will always be less than or equal to phi2 of x, and this holds, and so therefore um, you get this, this increasing sequence of phi n's. Okay, so what else do we know? Um, we also know that f is integrable, and that's just by assumption, and we also know that phi n of x, if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of phi n of x, what is this going to be? Well, if we look at this, um, oh, well, I guess I didn't really prove this in detail. Oh, this isn't, this isn't very good. Um, basically, the point here is that we have pointwise convergence. Um, so here's what the answer is going to be. The limit as n goes to infinity of phi n of x is going to be f of x. Why is this true? Suppose f of x is infinity, which can happen with um, integrable functions, measurable functions in general, generable. Um, and 
So if f of x is infinity, then hmm, then x is not going to belong to any particular e n. Hmm, that's a little odd. Maybe we don't consider that case, right? Because we actually need pointwise convergence here because if we don't have it, Yeah, I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm no longer convinced that this proof is true in general. Hmm. Yeah. Cuz what if you have something that's like your function f looks like you take This is some number A, this is B. And then to the right and to the left, you have these two things. And this, the, these approach a asymptote. And you've got a finite area under, so if this is um, region one and this is region two, you've got a finite area under Re region 1 is a finite area and region 2 is a finite area. This is possible if they hug the asymptotes tightly enough. Then, And then we define this function f to be infinity between a and b. Then the integral is obviously going to be infinity. But if we look at the limit of the sums of the these functions that we've defined here, um, None of the numbers between a and b are going to belong to any e n comma m. And for the regions from minus infinity to a and then from b to positive infinity, we're going to end up with a finite sum here because this thing is always going to be less than or equal to f, um, which we will prove for the case of f taking on finite values. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to get finite value. And so this will actually converge to a limit, which is just the area of one. Um, so let's call this area one and then area two, just to be clear. It, so this sum here, I think, will converge to the area of region one plus the area of region two, which is not the integral. So I think, there, I think we have to be careful here. Let's assume that f is integrable and finite everywhere. If we assume that f is finite everywhere, then this works. I'm not sure if that's a necessary condition for this proof to work, um, but it certainly is sufficient. And that's because if f is finite, then um, what's going to happen is you look at phi n minus f, and on any set where f where f is finite, the difference between f and phi n is what is it? It's two to the n because that's the distance between m over two to the n and m plus one over two to the n. Wherever f x is finite because um, f of x minus v n of x is always going to be strictly less than 2 to the n. It will always be positive because if we just look at this, um, v of n on, e n on e n comma m, v of n is going to be the minimum value that f of x could possibly take. Um, so f of x is a, going to be a value which is between m over 2 to the n and m plus 1 over 2 to the n, and phi n is going to be m over 2 to the n, and so the difference is going to be, at most, 
to the end. And so, yeah. So we have f is integrable. The phi ends converge, or the, the phi ends are an increasing sequence of, of uh, integrable functions, and they converge pointwise to f. Then by, and I'm going to cheat a little bit here, by dominated convergence, the limit as n goes to infinity of this sum from 1 to infinity of m times 2 to the minus n mu of e n comma m, well we can see that this is precisely the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of phi n d mu, and applying dominated convergence here, this is equal to the integral of the pointwise limit of the phi n's, which is f d mu. And so the reason I'm cheating here is that I'm using dominated convergence, but you prove dominated convergence in the next section. So could you do this exercise without applying dominated convergence? Probably. But that solution would, would probably just follow the proof of dominated convergence. And this exercise, this is a standard application of dominated convergence. So I don't know why they would want you to do this without using dominated convergence. It just seems unnecessary. So if you just, I mean, if you really, if I feel, I feel like if your teacher really wants you to prove this using the techniques that you have from this section, well, you already have the techniques you need to use to prove dominated convergence, so you just prove dominated convergence and then apply this. Of course, that's not really a spirit, and it does make you want, when you're doing that, it does make you wonder if there is a simpler, easier way of doing exercises like this. But nevertheless, I, I, when I see something like this, I just automatically think dominated convergence, and it works perfectly well. And so this is a perfectly good solution, and we're done.